All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Jason Hansen. We're at Hansen Vineyards. Uh, it's June 16th, 2020. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, happy to have you. Uh, first question, most important question, why wine? Oh, gosh. Um, it kind of goes back to the early aughts. Mm -hmm. um, I was living in Washington, D.C., and was beginning to realize that I needed to get back to the Pacific Northwest. And I had gotten off the corporate train and I knew I didn't want to come back and, and, and do that. So it was a couple year exploration of what I was gonna do to be able to come back to Oregon uh, using the resources I had, i.e. the family farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, create something that was going to uh, pay the bills. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, in the early off there was a, a kind of a second or third uh, boom mm -hmm. of Oregon wine going on. And uh, my dad had been a lifelong hobby winemaker. Mm -hmm. You know, you grow up in the country, there's extra fruit, there's extra this, there's extra that. Yeah, you do something with it, whether it's beer or wine or something but uh so he knew the the basics uh had taken a few classes and so in 2002 2003 we started planting grapes and then in 2004 uh, we built out great grandpa's chicken house into our winery space and off we went nice so before we get back into that, tell me a little bit about, about the property, about the history of the property with, with your family. So um, the story actually starts a little bit before, actually long before this property. Uh, great, great grandpa Hansen purchased the farm across the road in 1896. Uh, came over from Norway with his family. And then an unrelated to him, great grandfather bought this property in 1930. And the guy across the road had a grandson, and the guy on this farm had a daughter, and they looked across the road and said, eh, you'll do. <laughs> and those were my grandparents. Uh, so, uh, you know, back then there was no Tinder. Uh, you simply married the nice Norwegian boy across the road. <laughs> and so we've been here farming uh, in uh, this part of the Willamette Valley for uh, a very long time. And... Um, my grandparents had berries. Mm -hmm. uh, my, across the road was a dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, farming has been kind of the thing that we do uh, for a long time. Uh, my father was also a teacher mm -hmm. and principal. Uh, so he didn't, wasn't much into uh, as direct a farming uh, as, as the rest of the family was. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, when we planted grapes, we kind of revived that tradition. So tell me about what goes into the process of taking this space that has been so many things that's clearly farmland and has and turning it into a vineyard. What did you have to learn? What did you have to know it to get it started? Well, we already had the basics of farming and grapes. It's farming, you know. It, it, it's it, it's not um, a unique proposition, particularly compared to other kinds of things that are grown here in the Willamette Valley. Um, you know, building out the, the tasting room and the winery space uh, was challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to, you know, we wanted to use the resources that we had. So that meant uh, taking a look at the chicken house and figuring out how do we make this work? Uh, how do we, you know, work with the county to make it, uh, you know, a viable mm -hmm. option? Mm -hmm. um, there were challenges uh, in, in the build out. Um, I like to say we kind of have a rustic charm. Uh, you know, this is not a fancy marble palace to wine on uh, on a hilltop. Uh, this is uh, uh, oh, oh, rustic is a word we, we really do like to use. Um, so the planting uh, has been uh, pretty simple, uh, small bites. Uh, we are now farming what, about 13 acres of vines. Uh, maybe a bit more than that at this point, uh, but we've always just taken small bites every year. We, we never plant more than an acre in, in a year. Um, it's expensive to, to plant grapes. 
Um, and so we've tried to keep the process in-house, meaning we do the work. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, half an acre, an acre, quarter acre, small block here, small block there, mm -hmm. is, is uh, led to organic growth rather than just putting in 30 acres of grapes and trying to go from zero to 60 in, in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you've gone along, tell me about deciding what you wanted to plant and, and grow here. Well, we were thinking pretty traditionally mm -hmm. uh, early on. Uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and Riesling mm -hmm. uh, were the first three things that went in. Um, as we've grown, I've most definitely shifted away from uh, traditional grapes or traditional Wyoming Valley grapes. Um, we've got Pinot Blanc, we've got Cabernet Stramina, but we also have uh, Shell Foch. Mm. We've got Leon Mio. Uh, I've got a pretty uh, large block of a grape called Galabach. Mm. Uh, now it's a Russian varietal. Um, I decided a few years ago that there's a lot of good Pinot in the Wyoming Valley. I don't necessarily want to strive to get to the top of that heap, uh, and it might just be easier to start a few new heaps uh, and see if I can get to the top of those. <laughs> um, and I, actually that's where our uh, biggest growth uh, and successes have come. Um, my largest production wine by uh, uh, okay. a fair bit is a uh, very untraditional red blend mm -hmm. that uses four different grapes, uh, but I've got it on shelves across Oregon and strangely Vermont. So I'm gonna get back into I want to I want to get back into like the actual selling of wine in, in a little bit here, but I'm curious about the transition for you personally coming from you coming from here into D.C. into kind of the rat race and then back. Tell me about getting back into it and, and finding your passion here. What was it about the proposition of vineyard, winery, farming that 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 called to you, and what was it as you started to do it that was most appealing to you? Well, growing up on this farm, um, I knew the prospects of farming. Um, and at 18, I went 3,000 miles away to get away from that. Um, I did college uh, on the East Coast mm -hmm. and then grad school in Washington, D.C. And in the 14 years that I lived in Washington, D.C., uh, the metropolitan area grew by 1.5 million people. And we went through 9-11, and that really changed the character of the city. And I really enjoyed 12 years. In Washington, D.C., I really did not enjoy the last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some, I mean, very honestly, uh, some of the prospect was looking for that way out. Uh, how am I going to get out of D.C.? How am I going to get somewhere that's sane <laughs> again? Um, and looking at the farm as one of my best resources. Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful supportive family uh, that... Mom was motivated for me to come back from the East Coast, so, you know, <laughs> that helped. Um, there was some, some motivation to uh, help that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, wine was something that I enjoyed. Every time I would come back to visit, mm -hmm. uh, we'd always go wine tasting. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, it was a... something I, I already knew I liked. Uh, and it seemed possible and viable. As you got started with it, tell me something that maybe surprised you about the business of wine and grapes versus maybe what you expected it to be. Gosh. I really didn't quite understand the three-tier um, mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. uh, and so that was a little difficult early on. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some travails with our first distributor. Um, 
luckily that was the only time we had uh, problems, but it, some of that stemmed from my ignorance and, and um, not knowing what to expect, and some of it came from they were just horrible at selling wine. Um, I also didn't realize that it is more of a people job than I expected. Um, I don't know why I didn't expect this, but you know, people are basically coming to your home. You know, the winery is is at the family home, and sitting down on your patio outside the winery and wanting you to talk to them. <laughs> and I hadn't put that together. Uh, that it is all about talking to people. It's all about uh, telling your story. Okay, it's all about wine education. Um, I do more wine education uh, in a weekend than I, and every weekend, than I really ever expected mm -hmm. I would do. But people are curious, mm -hmm. and people just have questions, and so often uh, they don't know where to get answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when they're sitting there with a glass in front of them, um, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about wine, to talk about, about grape growing, to talk about winemaking, uh, talk about the difference between a small winery and um, what you buy on the grocery store shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very different products. Um, and uh, people are curious. And it, it's, I, I just hadn't expected that to be such a prime part of, of the job. Mm -hmm. I'm curious with that too, especially uh, as you've been in the job now for a while. Have the questions changed? Has the level of knowledge people come in with changed or what they're curious about changed? Well, my level of knowledge has certainly changed, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, but absolutely, absolutely. Um, people are more interested in and more aware of weather mm -hmm. than they used to be. Uh, mm -hmm. People are more curious about process than they used to be. Um, there's still just, I think, a general lack of knowledge in the wider populace of exactly how it all works. Uh, grapes, magic, <laughs> bottle being poured in front of me. Um, but uh, uh, people are starting to get a little bit more sophisticated in, in, in what they're asking. You can tell people are asking questions more often when they go wine tasting about the process, about grape growing, about uh, wine making, mm -hmm. um, uh, organics, uh, biodynamics. People are starting to become familiar with those words. Let's talk about that, then as long as we're talking about that, let's talk about your process here. And uh, with grape, we'll start with grape growing specifically. Tell me about your kind of vineyard philosophy and, and how it's maybe changed since you started. We were full on just conventional uh, uh, for the first, I'd say 10 years. Uh, we've been shifting uh, to get as close to organic as we can with this site. Mm -hmm. um, the farm is actually 30 feet or so below the Willamette Valley. Uh, Butte Creek comes uh, through, is on the back of this property, and has cut a, uh, a swath through here. Uh, and so we're 30 feet below that great soil uh, on the Willamette Valley, and we actually have heavy clay and rock and sand. And we're also in a fog and frost pocket because mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm never going to, I don't intend ever to try to become fully organic uh, because there are years that, you know what, uh, when the fog sets in, um, there's nothing you can do but uh, use chemistries to prevent uh, a complete meltdown in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, we're moving as close as we can uh, as possible. We've given up glyphosate. Uh, we are using uh, chemistries as rarely as possible. Mm -hmm. um, most years anymore, uh, my um, 
My spray program is organic oil and sulfur. So uh, that's that's the goal. Um, but I'm not horribly dogmatic about uh, a lot of those things. I think close is comfortable for me. Um, on the wine making side, um, non-interventionist is the term I like to use. Um, we grow the best possible grapes we can. Uh, we don't use uh, commercial yeasts. Uh, we don't add tannins. We don't add acid. We don't add anything really. Uh, I will. Um, I will. Um, Words are failing me. Uh, I will use uh, uh, fighting mm -hmm. agents, mm -hmm. uh, but but that's about it. Um, we do use sulfites. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're not trying to be uh, dogmatic overly, uh, but I've just decided that adding stuff to wine doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I don't I don't need to make a consistent product. I'm just trying to make a delicious and interesting uh, product and I, I think we can do that without adding a bunch of stuff. Um, I didn't go to school for winemaking uh, so I don't have real um, strong views that when I look at a lab report that my numbers need to be here or there or I need to fix something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't care. <laughs> uh, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And your Foley estate at this is that point? Is, so tell me about the, the process of learning the estate and what it's going to translate to in, in the bottle. I'm still learning the estate. Um, we have a the estate is made up of three vineyard blocks. This property, uh, a 40, now two year old block of uh, own rooted pomard at three miles north, mm -hmm. and a brand new block at my house, which is a mile up the road here, which is being planted to Gamay. Um, I think after 15 years of farming it, we finally locked in how to farm the 40-year-old uh, pomard. Uh, finally, these last two years, we've had just exactly the results that we've been looking for. Um, so I, I, I think we've finally gotten that lesson learned. I could be wrong, <laughs> you never know. Uh, but, but I think we got that one locked down. Here, it's, every year is different. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the things I like about grape growing and wine making. Um, uh, what's the old uh, uh, old line? Uh, you want to hear God laugh? Tell her your plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have found that it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to have a firm plan uh, of how you're going to farm because you don't know what the weather's going to be next week. Uh, you don't know how hot August is going to be. Um, I try to just adapt week by week to what comes, um, and that seems to be pretty good. Uh, <laughs> we, we get through most years uh, without too many problems. Um, again, because of the site, uh, we do have, uh, we don't get as much wind uh, in our little sub valley, uh, and we don't. Um, and we do get more uh, moisture, more fog, and so that causes problems. And so powdery mildew, of course, is always mm -hmm. a constant struggle. Uh, we've tended to uh, move to more leaf stripping, uh, and even 100% leaf stripping in the fruit zone most years now, mm -hmm. and doing it earlier. Uh, and uh, so if there's one farming lesson that I've learned, it's that doing that uh, is far more effective than spraying things. Mm -hmm. So, but that's time consuming, uh, and uh, you get as much done as you can. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Um, so you talked a little bit about the your kind of winemaking philosophy, non-intervention, kind of adapting, and I like to talk about not consistent but interesting. So tell me about how that translates when you're pouring for someone who maybe had one of your wines in the past and it tastes different that year, or is it doesn't taste like what they expected to taste. How tell me about that kind of process of education and and I guess sales of wine, something that isn't the same every year. Yeah, that is a familiar conversation. Um, so I make a Pinot Blanc, and three, four years ago, maybe five years ago now, um, a flavor, a new flavor note showed up, pineapple. Pineapple is not a common flavor note uh, known to Pinot Blanc, but bam, there it was, and I could say, hey, did, are you getting the pineapple? Uh, and then, oh yeah, that's what that is. The next year. Pineapple showed up. It's showed up every year since. Um, it might disappear, but now I can tell people, yeah, we've got a really weird uh, Pinot Blanc. It's not like any Pinot Blanc you've ever had. Uh, it's got this great uh, uh, flavor note that's, that's really unusual. Um, that's a fun conversation to have with people. Um, and it's, I don't know why it's presenting with, with pineapple. No idea. Uh, I don't know why it just showed up all of a sudden five years ago. Um, but I like it. Mm -hmm. um, I make a uh, co-fermentation of Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and Pinot Blanc. Um, it's rather unusual. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know of anybody else who's doing that. But it prompts a fun conversation. Um, I like to play, mm -hmm. um, and because we're small, uh, because my two distributors kind of work on that more natural, unusual, um, you know, don't have to worry about um, making the people at uh, Safeway happy with something year in, year out, mm -hmm. it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wouldn't really want to work any other way. Uh, I'd rather have people say, that's really interesting. I've never tasted anything like that. It's not my cup of tea. Then I would to make a, a boring Pinot Gris that everyone would say, oh, yeah, that's nice. Uh, I don't want to make... That tastes like Pinot Gris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. um, you know... I've made wines that some people have really embraced and other people have really let me know that I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, but I would rather have that kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I don't drink boring wine. I, I don't want to make boring wine. I want I'm curious about the, the, that conversation and, the, and the, the, the confidence it takes to get to that point where you can make something that you think is interesting and not really care if people like it or don't or, or, or tell you how much they don't like it. Tell me about getting to that point where you're putting this personal product out there in front of someone knowing that they may just say, man, this is terrible. You don't know what you're doing. Um, I've been there for most of my adult life. Um, it's, it's very hard to offend me. Um, I decided as a relatively young man that if I don't care about someone's opinion, then they certainly, whatever they say, can't possibly offend me, right? Um, it's only people whose opinion I really care about that can, can wound. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if, if my dad came in and said, Jason, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, I would be offended. <laughs> that, that would hurt. Uh, but people coming in that I don't know, no, I, that, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, luckily, that doesn't happen too often. It happens, but it doesn't happen too often. Uh, but getting a reaction, I think, is, is the interesting part. Um, having people think about it, having people respond with kind of passion mm -hmm. about not liking something or liking something mm -hmm. is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would rather evoke some sort of 
uh, strong emotion than simply mm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah that just doesn't sound appealing at all um, you're just kind of a a cog in a process um, and it's kind of a boring process <laughs> Uh, tell me about the, the, the process of, of selling wine uh, off of the kind of off the beaten path. Uh, obviously, you mentioned you're, you're in stores here. You have a, you're in Vermont somehow. Uh, and, uh, and Life is random. <laughs> and you have obviously people coming here. So tell me about the kind of process of figuring out your niche uh, when it comes to selling wine and finding customers when you are away from the kind of the, the heavier trafficked areas of Oregon wine. We are certainly far away from the heavily trafficked <laughs> areas. Um, we got very lucky. Uh, about the time that we were starting up, uh, my neighbor wineries were getting organized. And so when we came on, there was a, a brand new organization uh, then called the East Willamette Valley Winery Association. Uh, and that is now called the Cascade Foothills uh, uh, Wine Growers. And it is, uh, what, 16 wineries uh, surround me, uh, both to the north and to the south. Um, we don't have any super big members. Mm. Um, we're all growers. We all have tasting rooms. Um, we all genuinely like each other. Um, and that has probably been the biggest assistance uh, of anything we've done because when someone comes to St. Joseph's, just a few miles down the road, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the things that happens is on their way out the door, they're handed a map uh, where I'm one of the next two or three stops. Mm -hmm. um, when someone visits um, Pudding River, uh, same thing happens. Uh, when someone visits me, they don't leave without being offered a map. Uh, and that has been, uh, without doubt, the, the number one uh, way that people have found us. Mm -hmm. It's because of uh, my amazing neighbors. Um, and it's certainly helped me grow as a, a grape grower. Um, Chris Deckelman in Silverton at Vitus Ridge, if I have a problem and I don't understand what's going on, uh, he's got 30 years of grape growing uh, behind him and 300 acres. And so he's seen every problem, and so um, he's a great resource. You know, when I have uh, funny results from the lab, you know, th there are people I can call and say, hey, mm -hmm. did, have you seen this before? What would you do? Um, so it's a, the camaraderie of the organization is, is uh, terrific. Um, it helps me sell wine. Uh, it helps people find the tasting room. Um, probably doesn't really help people pick it out on a, a store shelf, uh, but uh, most definitely it brings people uh, out here to the tasting room. You know, we've tried online advertising, we've tried uh, ads in newspapers and magazines. Word of mouth is really uh, the number one uh, way that people end up here. Mm -hmm. um, and then Google Maps. <laughs> um, we're the only winery listed. Well, no, there's not, that's not true. We're one of two wineries listed in Woodburn, and the big shopping mall mm -hmm. in Woodburn. People go and, and shop for a few hours, and they start. What else is there to do? We're bored, and we we end up with a lot of folks that way. <laughs> it's either wine or this or the speedway, I guess. At that oh, point. wine or the speedway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's, you, you mentioned earlier your the growth of the business and the growth of the vineyard as being very organic and very, very slow. Uh, uh, as you uh, as you sit here now, are you where you want it, Are you where you want to be? Do you have immediate plans to change, or is this kind of is this the, the growth process what you want it to look like going forward? We're on a really comfortable growth pattern right now. Uh, again, putting in half an acre or an acre every year. Um, We've got one, two, maybe five or six more acres to go to the point where everything will be planted out. That will be more than enough. Um, 
I would like to grow into maybe one or two more states. Mm -hmm. um, I would certainly like to see traffic grow here, mm -hmm. but not too much. Um, I do sell grapes every year to three or four other uh, winemakers. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very comfortable outlet to and pressure release valve. I can usually up that a little bit in years that I, oh, there's still a lot in the warehouse, let's, uh, let's uh, tighten up a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas other years, oh, we're blowing through the rustic red, I need to keep uh, uh, more of the uh, Leon Mio and, and uh, having mm -hmm. that as another uh, uh, leg to the stool is, is, mm -hmm. is very nice. But I don't ever want to be a big winery. You know, I don't want to be Willamette Valley Vineyards. There's nothing attractive. I mean, I'm not slamming Willamette Valley Vineyards. They do a wonderful thing. It's just I don't see a, an attractive proposition in being a manager. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm the winemaker. I'm the grape grower. I'm the janitor. I'm legal advice. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, I'm in the tasting room almost every weekend, mm. um, and I like that. Mm. Uh, that's the model I, I want to keep. Um, having a bunch of employees doing these things would, is, is not what I want to do. Mm. I, I don't want to manage people. Um, I, I want to, to farm and make wine and have every day be a little bit different. You know, yesterday, uh, I bottled wine all morning. Maybe next week I'll get to do that again. Um, tomorrow I'll be out in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, that's wonderful. I, I would be bored to tears if I had to go and do the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. and, and I see getting big and, and managing people as doing the same thing mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. You bring up a good point that I want to ask you about the, the, the being both the grape grower and the winemaker. Uh, how do you go about managing your time? How do you go about balancing the needs since they're both such demanding propositions at, at times of the year? Uh, farming, grape growing is the big time sink mm -hmm. without doubt. Um, you know, we do most things by hand. I do occasionally get a crew to come in and help if I get behind, but we try not to do that too much. Um, up until two years ago, everything was family picked. Um, we won't be doing that anymore. I just don't have it in me. Um, but yeah, it, it, the vineyard is the driver of time. Um, if things have to get done out there, we don't bottle until there's a window and things have been done in the vineyard. Sure. Um, there's just no way around that. Um, so most of the time from, gosh, early January, I usually don't start pruning until January, mm -hmm. um, through about this time in June, it's five days a week out in the vineyard. Um, and then two days here in the tasting room. Uh, usually at some time in, in at this point, we've gotten everything into wires. Uh, there's some time, mm -hmm. get a lot of bottling done. We've actually done, because of the, the pandemic, um, that's kind of changed things this year. I'm way ahead on bottling. <laughs> um, having, what, two months where you've magically all of a sudden gotten two extra days a week mm -hmm. uh, has been, you know, strangely helpful. Uh, you know, not selling any wine, but... Uh, um, Certainly being able to get more done, we're, we're way ahead. I'm, I'm very pleased with how things are mm -hmm. uh, shaken out on the bottling this year. Uh, usually I would be finally releasing my summer wines in August. Um, but, but usually it's all driven uh, by, by the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to work out um, as I get older, I can probably see a little bit more uh, crew work coming in uh, and me doing a little bit less of that. Uh, but for now, uh, I like being out there. 
you bring up the pandemic that we're still in here of slowly reopening. Tell me about how things changed for your business. You mentioned having more time to do other things. Other ways that things have changed for you in the, in the past few months and, and as you look ahead for your own business. Well, I mean, like I just described, my normal routine is being alone in the vineyard for eight to 10 hours a day. So to a certain degree, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. um, having the tasting room closed for what, two and a half months was, we, we took a hit, mm -hmm. absolutely. We have a great, great uh, wine club uh, and wine kept moving out the door. Lots of curbside pickups, lots of, oh yeah, um, fill up a box for me, I'll be by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so we were still selling wine. Um, the wines that were going out uh, through distribution kept going out. Um, mm -hmm. So to that end, you know, having uh, both on-site and off-site was, I, I'm not complaining because there are, I know there are lots of neighbors that don't have distribution and are dependent upon their tasting rooms and they're going to, they've been hit much harder than I have. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, now that we've reopened, um, it's trying to adapt to the new realities. Um, it's trying to make sure that people who are a bit hesitant as yet to be coming out into the world and mixing with the great unwashed, uh, you know, they're nervous. And, and we're not up to uh, regular uh, speed yet. You know, mm -hmm. people are mm -hmm. coming out, but not coming out at the, the levels we would be expecting in, say, June of last year. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> moving through life without too many expectations, again, is probably the smart way to be trying for everyone to, to, to be doing this. Um, I, I certainly try to keep mine in check. Hey, you Tell me about, you, you, you have an interesting a viewpoint here from the, like you mentioned, the East, the East Valley, the Cascade Foothills, uh, uh, the little cluster up here and off the beaten path. Uh, tell me about the, what you've seen in the Oregon wine industry from your perspective since you became part of it. So you're going on almost 20 years now. Uh, Close. Get, getting there. Uh, <laughs> tell me about what you've seen uh, change in Oregon wine and, and what it looks like today uh, compared to when you started. Gosh, you know, I don't know. I am concerned about the number of wineries. Um, you know, we've the last two years we've seen breweries in Oregon dropping like flies, and longtime names that you know you think are just uh, stalwarts of the industry just one day announce that they're closing up shop. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of been wondering, especially the last couple of years, if mm -hmm. we're going to see that in wine. Um, it's a different model than, than breweries, I, but gosh, we are, the industry has just grown so much in the last 15 years. The mm -hmm. sheer number of wineries, um, the size of wineries in Oregon. Um, I don't know that it's completely sustainable. I look at the ads on winebusiness.com and you see massive amounts of wine on the bulk market and you just really didn't used to see that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm very curious. I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, but I'm going to be very curious over the next year or two, especially now in light of the pandemic, is everybody going to be able to go forward? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're lucky. Um, great grandpa paid off the mortgage. <laughs> um, we don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about uh, paying a whole bunch of employees. 
um, if things get tight, you know, they'll be tight for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I don't have to worry about a uh, leased location or, or a, a warehouse chuck a block with wine that I have no idea where it's going to go. Um, the other thing that I, I see is a lot of people aging out. Uh, just in the wineries that I'm friendly with, there's four or five that, you know, I don't know how much longer uh, they'll go, not because they're uh, not making great wine and able to sell it, mm -hmm. it's just that yeah, they want to retire. Uh, and it may not be something that continues down mm -hmm. uh, to another generation. Mm -hmm. And I have a sinking suspicion that that's fairly common mm -hmm. uh, in the Oregon wine industry. You know, we're so different in Oregon compared to like Washington. You know, Washington, what is it? Uh, Chateau Saint Michel makes about 60% of all the wine that comes out of, of the state. You know, we don't have any 800 pound gorillas mm -hmm. in Oregon at all. Um, it's mostly small, 5,000 and below case wineries. And that's A, wonderful. Uh, I think that's one of the best things about Oregon wine. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very different kind of business. And now that there's so many, 5,000 and below, um, you know, do we need 800? 900 in Oregon? I don't know that we do. Um, the third thing that I've noticed is the napification of the Willamette Valley. And that is something I absolutely just almost cry about. Um, I, I really hope that people in the industry will take a long, hard look at that and say, we don't want to do that. Um, you know, Oregon is able to sell expensive wine. It doesn't mean that it has to become an elitist, classist industry. And, and that's where it's heading right now. You know, charging 40 or $50 for, uh, for tasting, uh, you know, expensive sit-down, uh, appointment-only tastings. Mm -hmm. um, it it seems a bit divisive. Mm -hmm. um, I I I hope that we can find a way to remain more egalitarian, but I don't think that's going to happen. So on that note, what do you see as you look ahead for the industry in the next 10 years? And, and has the pandemic changed how you view the future of the industry at all? Not really. Um, I, I don't think it's going to grow at the rate it's been growing. Uh, I think this is going to be an excuse to hit pause for a lot of folks. Um, I think there might be some wineries that just close up shop. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so hard to know. Um, are we going to be successful at getting to the end uh, of, of this? Mm -hmm. um, if we are, you know, if, if the, the vaccine comes out and it works, um, you know, things will, I anticipate, kind of return to normal. I, I would expect they would. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why they wouldn't. Um, but who knows? Um, yeah, I, everyone around here is kind of getting a little tired of me just going, eh, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a joke now uh, that you can say that to everything because, you know, we don't know what's around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sometimes seems silly to, to make big plans when you don't know whether you can even leave your house next week. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, you know, things aren't all that different either. Mm -hmm. um, trying to be 
as adaptable as one can without appearing wishy-washy, I guess, is, <laughs> is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't spend a lot of time uh, trying to look into the crystal ball. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be what it'll be. I'm sure it'll be great. It's funny how it just takes a couple months. We all become kind of nihilistic about it. Like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked a bit about here. You have a few more acres to plant. You have kind of thought that out. You've, you're talking, thinking about your own personal process as you as you get older and wanted to maybe do a little bit less of this or that. Are there other sort of projects on the horizon for you, or things you'd like to try, or things you you talked about kind of playing? Oh, Is there yeah. anything else that you'd like to grow, or anything else you'd like to experiment oh, with? Oh yeah, yeah. I will never plant another Pinot Noir plant ever. Ever. I, I'm not anti Pinot, but there's plenty of Pinot out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, small blocks of other interesting things. Um, I most definitely want to get some uh, Zweigelt in the ground. Um, I am constantly uh, <clears throat> looking through the, the big encyclopedia of grape varietals, looking for things that A, I can get my hands on, uh, and B, that would work, um, or at least get close to working mm -hmm. here in the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I most definitely be looking at uh, continuing to plant more unusual varietals, uh, things that uh, aren't heavily planted here. I mean, look uh, at Gamay. You know, four years ago, there was an entire, there was 40 acres in the entire state of Oregon. And now there's, everybody's making mm -hmm. gamay. Uh, block after block is coming online every year. Uh, people are grafting uh, over to gamay. Um, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, I know the people in, in marketing Oregon wine are always banging away about Pinot Noir. But, and that's good. That's good. That makes sense. Um, but having some new varietals come on that can kind of step into and be uh, another another post for us to hang our hats on I think is important and I think Gamay might be that 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 varietal mm -hmm. we'll see mm -hmm. um, it certainly uh, seems to be uh, people are gaining knowledge about it um, more and more uh, when we first started uh, making Gamay you know people would Gammy, what's that? <laughs> and, gam <laughs> and, and now, you know, oh, you have a gamay, great. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you know, it, it's just taking more and more people making it to, uh, you know, create educated consumers. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think Mr. Weigelt might be uh, one of those things long term. Um, you know, what is it, 85%? of wine on shelves in North America comes from five grapes. Um, we're not going to change that here at Hanson Vineyards, but I can certainly change the mix for us and, mm -hmm. and making more unusual blends, mm -hmm. planting more uh, unusual varietals. Uh, that is most definitely the way we're going forward. Um, no more Pinot Noir, no more Pinot Gris. Um, unusual is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Well, last question for you, a okay. little bit philosophical for you. Okay. What is the role of wine in society? Oh, well, I think it is a wonderful way for people to make friends and aid in the communication between people. Um, it's also just a wonderful thing to sit down on a patio and ponder over without talking to anyone at all. Um, now, I have to admit, after a long day in the vineyard, I go and have an IPA. Uh, I think most winemakers and grape growers do that. Um, so, as long as we're adding in all kinds of libations, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's a it's an important part of how we uh, work together a, a, as humans. Um, 
the great lubricator sounds like a, a horrible thing to say, but it's true. Mm -hmm. um, it, it breaks down tension between people, makes it easier to make friends. And we could always do a little bit more with that, right? Absolutely. All the questions that I have for you, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? I don't think so. Awesome. I don't think so. Thank you so much hey, for your pleasure. time, for your stories, for your thoughts, and uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Great.